don't you understand? You didn't kill him. You didn't kill him. Harry. Harry. I'd learnt my craft from Hitchcock. Problem is, because you worked for Hitchcock, they automatically thought that you had to do horror pictures. I much prefer to work on a picture like Casablanca, a script like that, than a horror picture. But you know, that, that's what, like an actor gets typecast. You know, so does a director. And I suffered a lot from that, and it was hard to get away from the horror, even though it's very enjoyable to do them, you want to do other things as well. I'd studied aeronautical engineering in England, uh, gave that up and came to America, was always interested in film. And it was hard to get any job in England at that time as the film industry had practically collapsed. So I immigrated, arrived in New York, and you know, it was very hard to get in the film industry, but I thought if you got into the documentaries, at least you've got to step in. And I thought with this bunch of film, I'd set. So I got in a car, went to Hollywood, and nobody was the slightest bit of interested in documentaries. And so I just had to knock on doors. It was very hard to get a start. And my first break uh, came with uh, Universal Studios, Hitchcock who needed a, a story reader, uh, hired me, I guess because I had an English accent. <laughs> you know, they, anyway, they hired me. And I, I was reading for Hitchcock, getting him material, and then became the story editor. And then finally, as each person moved up the ladder, I ended up as a producer for his television series. And that was my sort of first entry into making movies rather than documentaries. I sort of forced them into letting me direct because I got the first directing opportunity. Hitch had, uh, there was a novel I was trying to get him to do and he rejected it. And a, an agent said he had a, a chance for me to do a feature if I could find a story and get it, and get it done. Uh, this is for 20th Century Fox as a B picture. They liked the story and they asked me, yes, would you, you can direct it. So I got a leave of absence from Hitch for th three weeks and we shot it in London f uh, and it was actually sold to Warner Brothers and it was the woman who wouldn't die and we shot it in three weeks. And then when I came back, the fellow offered me a contract for three pictures which had said, no, you've got, you're, you're under contract with me, you can't do those. So they had to give me, you know, a directorial thing on the show. That's how I got my first uh, picture. When I was in Hollywood, I was asked to produce the Saad for AIP, and we were going to shoot it in, in uh, Germany, at, in Munich. And, you know, Deke, who was my boss, was getting, said, who's this guy in America? I'm running the whole office in London for AIP, and they're, they're doing their biggest picture. This was a very, very expensive picture for AIP. And there, here's a guy who's freelancing, producing this picture. So they, I got fired off it. And I thought, my God, my career shot, I'll never work again, you know. But they gave me a consolation prize and said, look, we have a film in Ireland, we'd like you to produce that. So I read the script, and it was, gosh, it was the oblong box. The trick with the oblong box was, was to make it visually um, more exciting than this dead script. And, one of the great contributors to many of the pictures I made was, was Chris Wicking, who did a lot of rewrites uh, on this picture and did some, some scripts with me afterwards. So we had worked very well together. So I produced and directed it. I took the film to Shepperton Studios. Nobody at AIP was interested in this picture except Arkoff 
and Nicholson would come in and, and say, good luck, and then they disappear, and you think they'd be on the set every day. They were so completely involved with Dessart that they left me alone, and they came back when the film was finished and looked at the rushes and said, look, uh, why don't you spend another week on the picture and make it even bigger? So I got an extra week from the three weeks they got, so they were very happy with what they got. And the film was very successful then and made a lot of money, and I got a contract to do three pictures after that one. So that was my start with AIP. It is a banshee. Banshee? The way AIP worked was they would sell a name. Cry the Banshee was a script that came from Hollywood and was sent to us, and Chris and I went to Scotland to research about witches, to make, put something in it which was different. And uh, we met actual witches, you know, and the people who were witches, you know, they, they, they exist in Wales, I'm sure they do here. And Chris's idea was to make good witches and bad witches, which they are, and they're all related to the old religion, the religion of the Druids who came before Christianity. And Chris Wicking was always on the side of the underdog in his writing and made the witches the good people who were being oppressed by the Christians who came in. So it was a conflict between those two levels. Well, anyway, we were writing the script. We did a lot of research, and they gave us, a, 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 um, you know, very reasonable expenses to do all these things because normally these films are made on ridiculously low budgets, you know. Nobody will even believe what we made these films for at that time. But uh, AIP became very worried, Deke, because we were changing the script so much that he said, look, that's not the film we sold because they have already sold the film to the distributor on the title. And we were changing it so much that, he, uh, that Deke said, look, stop, you can't go any more rewriting. It's, uh, you can only write, change it 10%. You know, he was so angry. <laughs> anyway, that's whatever we were able to do, we changed it 10%, and that's what, what the audience got. Because these films already, when they're sold, they're already in the exhibition. So by the time you start on it, you know you have an end date bef before they're distributing it. So that everybody gets nervous. If you say the film's gonna be made in 15 days or 20 days, you will be guaranteed it will come in at that time. Hitchcock was a very disciplined filmmaker. He had you know, worked out everything on paper beforehand so that the, that was the part which he enjoyed the most when he's on his own and could create it. When it came to making the film, it was boring for him because it was recreating what he'd already done. And the trick on these films to get them out is that if you're really organized uh, and have done all the creative work beforehand, you can't suddenly stop three or four hours and say, oh no, this is not the way, let's do it some other way. That's, that's the way we had to, to do our pictures at that time. What Sam Arkoff would do in Nicholson, they would come into town. They'd stay at the Waldorf Astoria, the most the, you know, big suite. You'd go up there, you'd present him with some cigars, because he loved cigars, and then you would tell him what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and he said, that's fine, and then off he went back to... And then Deke was really the man who was responsible for getting it all done. Hey, Father, you may have heard that they think of me as some kind of a monster in the village. <laughs> Vincent Price a is a unique truth. person, extraordinary uh, is man of great talent. And I felt, you know, he, he was being put into a genre of horror pictures that he probably didn't really want to do because he's, he's done some extraordinary work in his time. He's a stage actor and so on. And Vincent Price was, you know, part of the, of the package, so you, it worked all around him, and he's getting all the money. But he's a wonderful person. 
I was at Shepherd and Studios, and there was some prince from Africa who'd come to the studio and was asked to entertain him, so I invited Vincent. And Vincent kept us all enthralled at, at lunch because all he talked about was African art to the, uh, to the African princes. And just unique uh, knowledge that he had of, of a different world that most people in our entertainment business would ever know or think about or talk about. I have spared your life as a reminder that I will not tolerate your heathen way. You remember Gilbert and Sullivan, the, the great opera team? They ha he lived in a huge mansion north of London, and we rented this mansion, and th there was 20 or 30 acres of, of land with the farms and so on. We rented the whole place and shot the whole picture there. So it was all on location, but close to London. So it had a unique uh, kind of ambience that worked well. And England's a wonderful place to shoot for cameramen. It's, it's the, the pastel shades, you know, it's always clouded. And cameramen like this pastel look. And that's what makes the color so much better in many pictures. It helps a great deal to give a three-dimensional effect. If you put something in the foreground, it gives it great depth, and you can use the foreground to help dramatize the scene. You put a pillar right in front of the camera on the side, you get a feeling of the depth of distance, or to create a mood, or to prepare you for something that might be coming on at, at a later date. John Coquillion was a very unique cameraman. He was young, and he had a marvelous assistant, and his assistant would hand carry the camera. He was one of the best hand, it was almost like a, a camera dolly he was, so we'd use him as much as that as possible. But he was very talented, Canadian, and after he finished that film, he got offered his first very big American picture, I think The Straw, Straw Dogs. And from then on, his career uh, zoomed. He, he, did, he did very well. But he was, you know, what our cha my challenge to the cameraman was at the time was most of the British films, the Hammer horror films, were all static shots placed, you know, in the standard positions and everything was composed. We were constantly moving the camera, you know, to give a feeling of moving on to the next. And that was a kind of wave, a new wave of picture making that came in at the time, which is now fairly standard. And it was very hard to shoot on location because of the lights, where to put the lights and so on. I liked studio so much better because it's more controlled. But if we were in a, a makeshift police station, which was just... Uh, rented house that you turned into a police station, we would rehearse the scene and then keep going and see if I could see how long we could keep going without stopping the camera. And you could see uh, Johnny Cochillon wilting as I said, look, let's just go take it just one bit further into the next room. Can we move into the next room? And so finally the whole place was lit and we could move our actors, flow them from one scene to another to make it interesting rather than just have two people talking on a desk side by side, you know. But he was wonderful at that, and his assistant, and he was very talented, I thought. <laughs> the director can be there as a guide to the actor because many actors are very insecure. They don't know if they're doing it right, if they could do it better, or if, they're, if they got the handle on the idea of the thing. So you, the discussions take place before the picture takes place of what the character is, so that's fundamentally secure in their mind, and you, you agree upon that beforehand. You may argue about it, but you make that decision. Then when you're playing it, you leave the guy alone. Let him do what he wants. Let him play it as much as he wants. You can tone him down, and the actor uh, many a time wants to go further than he should, just to show what he can produce. What can I do for you, my lord? Well, now, my girl, you don't want to spend the whole of your life as a serving wench, do you? And then you know what he, he's going to do, and then you can quietly tell him, look, that's fine. Think it this way and do it this way, and you're, you're fine. You leave him alone, and it's, he's fine all the way around. 
you know, the actor is in a very precarious position and he has to trust the director, you know, that, and go to him if he's doing a bad job, you know, but you can't help an actor who is poor. You can't make his role, him, him much better, you know, uh, than, than what he's capable of doing. It's got to be a personal thing with the actor because, you know, you might whisper something to him uh, that he can do that will make his scene better with, with a counterpart actor, that he could try it. If you told what, what you were saying to the other actor, it, it uh, might, you might not get the surprise of the reaction the other person has to have for that particular scene. You didn't kill him. He's dead. His head was blasted from his body. Where is he? Really, the real thing is to leave the actor alone as much as possible. You know, and as long as they're being truthful when they read the script, that they are really truthful. You could almost, you don't need the sound. You, if you could not hear what they're saying, you can tell if the actor's really believing what he's doing. That's the test. If he does, the scene's going to come out marvelously if it's a well-written scene. Who is it? It was a difficult picture to shoot on location, you know, where you're dependent on English weather. You know, it's very, very hard to shoot in England, but particularly exterior, and there's a lot of exteriors in there. But there was a wonderful cast. There's some wonderful people. We all enjoyed had a lot of fun making it. I must say, they, everybody enjoyed it. As Vincent Price said, you've got to believe in it as the actor. You know, many of them would laugh at a script or a word or so, or they would say, look, what am I doing this? But as Vincent would say, you've got to really believe what you're doing and, and get into it. And that's the only way you can make the film a success. Mm -hmm.